but um, we can be lifted up even in the book of Revelation, especially if we know we're not there, <laughs> we won't be there. <laughs> That's what excites me about it. <clears throat> now, there's no doubt in my mind there's going to be a resurrection. Very clear in the scriptures, there's many resurrections. Jesus was the first fruit of the resurrection. There's other resurrections, even in the book of Revelation, the two witnesses that testify during that period of time will be resurrected. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, there'll be a resurrection of the resurrected saints. That is the resurrected saints that lost their life during the tribulation years that was here. Those that didn't make the, the first resurrection or the, I would say the second resurrection because Jesus was the first. And then even when Jesus was resurrected, remember a lot of them came out of the grave. How many remember that? The, the graves opened and the righteous people came out and went around in Jerusalem and witnessed to people. So we know there's a resurrection, so you can drive that stake down. Now there's a debate whether pre, mid, post, uh, post-rab, not rab, but post-raf. In other words, the church is taken up just before the the raft of God, which is poured out in the second half of the tribulation. But then we know that he's coming for those that are looking for his appearance. And I, I thought that through. And I, and I say, hmm. So what I really see here is that if you're not looking for his return, you're probably not ready. Some of you ain't moving. <laughs> If you're really ready, how many knows you'll be looking for him? Can you see that picture? Okay, so that can tell you if you're ready because you're looking for him. And I don't think anybody down there in the honky-tonk doing the boogie-woogie is looking for the Lord at that point. Uh, I have an idea he's looking for something else. I remember one time when uh, Susan's sister came down and her husband came down. Susan and me were, I was young in the faith. We haven't, hadn't got a handle on some of the things that we should get a handle on as Christians at that time. And they wanted to go to this uh, honky-tonk place. You know, it, was, it wasn't the worst type. It wasn't the best type, but it was in between. It wasn't too bad. And you know, you could order your meal and drink your booze. And uh, of course, well, I, I, I had overcome the drink, drinking problem at that time, but we were persuaded by them to go. <laughs> that Charles back there? <laughs> <laughs> so we, we went, you know, and we're sitting there, Susan is sitting there. We felt like two Misfits, that's for sure. Our spirit just could not absorb that atmosphere anymore. And we were both looking at one another. And I think I whisper, I do not, I am not looking for the Lord to return right now. I am not looking for him. No, Lord, don't come right now. Let me get, let us get out of here first. Get right with God and we'll be looking for you. But right now I ain't looking for the, I'm looking to get out of this place right now. How many understand what I'm talking about? See, we have the nature of God in us now. Everybody say, I got the nature of God. See, that's the beautiful thing about it. You talk with people that don't have the nature of God. You can tell the difference. You can, it's not a matter of judging them. It's just that's the way the spirit functions. You, can, you sense, you know, they don't have the life of God in them. They don't have the spirit of God in them. And it's not that we're saying we're better or nothing like that. But that's just the way it works. And if you're in a place where you don't feel comfortable, something, you know, you need to get out of there. 
How many of you understand what I'm talking about? Okay, most of you know. That's good. All right. So I want to start with this first scripture, and it's found in Jude chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Two scriptures is very good here, and I like these scriptures. We've got 45 minutes. We'll let you go. All right. Not Judges, but Jude. Jude 1, 14. Excuse me. It was of these people, moreover, that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied when he said, Behold, the Lord cometh with his migrate of holy ones, ten thousand of his saints. All right. So he's coming. Now, when is he coming? You know, we're not re- would you go back to that scripture one more time? I'm sorry. All right, it was, all right. When is he coming? And who is he coming with? So you've got to break the scriptures down. And re- Oh, he's coming. All right. And who prophesied that? Enoch prophesied that. And the Lord is coming. And who's he coming with? All these ten thousands of his saints. Now we go over to the book of Revelation, chapter 19. We find that we're riding white horses. Back in the saddle again. That's exciting. How many girls like to ride horses? I remember Lisa, when she was a little girl, had that little horse. Remember the little horse she had? That horse, it was a little horse. She'd ride that little horse. And all the geese back there would go. Bah, 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 bah. So you put these scriptures together and we see that all right, if he's coming back with these 10,000 saints, at some point in the back, they have to be resurrected to get up there, to get ready to get on those horses and come back down. Does that make sense? All right, so you have to interpret the scriptures that way. So let's go to the next verse now, and I could say a lot more on that, but we don't have that much time. All right, there we go. All right, why is he coming? Why is the Lord coming with all these saints? He's coming to the earth. Oh, execute judgment. Microphone. Microphone. This one? Is, it's on? Oh, I'm sorry, Frank. All right, to execute judgment upon all. Well, you could say upon all. Does that mean us? Now, let's interpret Scripture. Couldn't mean us. Why? Because the previous Scripture says we're coming down with Him. <laughs> you see that? How many can understand Scripture when you get into the Word of God and get revelation working on you? You begin to say that upon all, well, we not here. Well, where are we? Verse 14, we own horses. Can you see that? So you break the Scriptures down and the Lord shows you all of that. And, and so he's coming upon all and to convict all the impious unholy ones. Now notice, the, go back to the next Scripture. Prior to that, 14. Go back to 14. What does it say there? He's coming back. The Lord is coming with his holy ones, the 10,000 of his saints. So he's coming back on the earth and he's going to judge the world. All right, go back to the other verse now, 15. And to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the impious, unholy ones. That's basically what impious means means, if I'm pronouncing that right, of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed. And just think, they could have had all of those sins washed away. All those sins could have been washed away if they would have accepted Christ because he bore the sins of the world. But they rejected him. So ungodly, which they have committed in such an ungodly way And of all of the severe, abusive, jarring things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him, against Christ. Now, let's get our mind to to, to think about what these ungodly people, I mean, who can you think of? How about the ISIS? 
Would you say uh, the ISIS were holy folks? Unholy, wicked, worshipers of false gods. So you break scriptures down and you get to understand that he's not coming back to execute judgment upon the righteous. Christ took our judgment. Help somebody say, get happy. So you got to see that. So when you see the scriptures, that's a powerful, powerful thing to understand. He's coming back because... Now, some people say, well, how in the world could a righteous God do that? I mean, let me, let me just bring you a little um, analogy here. <clears throat> I had this man talking to me about, sure, I just can't believe how God allowed the Israelites to go in and kill even the children, the, uh, the, the mothers and, the, and the, the fathers and those little babies and all. Why did God tell uh, 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 Saul, the King, King Saul, through Samuel to kill every one of them and all the beasts and all of the cattle, kill them all, destroy them all. All right, I got myself in the corner, ain't I? <laughs> well, let me show you what I, what I know. If you know the future, let me put it down this way. Here, here's a young child, and if, if I don't kill him now, he'll grow up 20 years from now, be a man, and he'll kill probably about 150 of my people. Now think about that. So if I kill him here as a child, he won't be able to kill that 150 20 years down the road. How many see that? See that? You know he won't change. See, you know the future. God knows the future. He knows what that person will do. And so he'll take him out as a child. Well, now, you know, for the natural mind, oh, that's horrible. No, it's not. Think about the 150 that God is saving by taking that one kid out. Are you out there? And you go back in the scriptures, and uh, Frank and me know that because we've studied about the one guy that, uh, I can't think of his name now, but uh, he's, it was an, uh, it was, uh, who? who? Yeah, it was, uh, that was in uh, Babylon, and uh, he was going to, he was going to, Haman was going to kill all the Jews. I mean, you know that. Well, if you trace that Haman back, he goes all the way back to one of those women that Saul didn't kill. Is that right, yeah. Frank? If I remember correct. Now think about that. That's why Samuel had to get on Saul about that. He's just quiet in here. <laughs> oh, See, God knows what he's doing. You might not understand it, but I'm at a point in my life that God can do no harm. That's where I'm at. If I disintegrate, God ain't done no wrong. He cannot do no wrong. That's my faith in my, in my Father in heaven. He can do no wrong. So you might as well not even entertain any thoughts that Jesus or God does, or who is God, doesn't know what he's doing. Everybody say, God knows what he's doing. Even though you might don't understand all of this that's going on in the book of Revelation, God knows what he's doing. Boy, that will clear up a lot of mis and misunderstandings in your life. And won't put a barrier between you of some type of resentment towards God. That in your thinking, he's a bad God. And it makes you want to withdraw from him. Are you out there? All right. Susan and me have had the privilege... I guess you could call it a privilege to witness to a lot of couples in our lives. This man couldn't understand why his wife was withdrawing from him. And I'm not going into all the things that she was withdrawing from, but <clears throat> he couldn't get to understand. And I said, well, let's just check how you're treating her. Quiet in here. <laughs> if 
For one to have friends, one must show himself to be friendly. What has all that got to do with the book of Revelation? I don't know. <laughs> but you've learned something. And it has something to do with Revelation because people don't understand that why would God do that? God's a just God. Yes, sir. God's a loving God, a forgiving God, but God is a just God and he must judge wickedness. That's why Christ came and took the judgment where God could be set free from it because the penalty was paid. God didn't have to sweep it up under the rug. No, it was paid for by your Savior and my Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, he took the punishment and we've been set free. And that's God's grace. Amen. Amen. That's God's grace. Now, if, you reje- if a person rejects it, there's the will of man. There's the will of man. I told Susan tonight we were talking about the will of man. I said, honey, just think, if you didn't have a will <clears throat> or you couldn't do what you willed to do, when you met me, you wanted to marry me. But your father wanted you to marry this other guy down here. Because this other guy had money, had land. Now, we're not kicking that. (laughs) I tell girls, I mean, listen, if the guy don't drive up in your driveway with a car, cut him off. (laughs) Until he gets a car. He may be a good old boy, but you got to see some fruits, right? Come on, are you out there? (laughs) I'll show you my faith by my automobile. (laughs) That's works. All right. Now, here's what I want to do. Let's get our pictures straight. Let's go back a little bit. We're talking about there's some things in the book of Revelation we just can't nail down at this point. Now, we've nailed down a lot of different things and uh, we can feel sure about certain things. But there's some things, for example, that are very controversial, so to speak, okay? For example, Babylon. All right, who is Babylon? What is Babylon? The Bible talks about Babylon. All right, what I want to show you, that I, and I feel real secure, secure, yeah, secure in saying this, that there's two Babylons, all right? Now, this might go against your study, but just hold steady. (coughs) One is a spiritual Babylon, and the other is a commercial Babylon. Just hold those two pictures. When you study chapter 17 in the book of Revelation, you you are dealing with the spiritual Babylon. In 18, you're dealing with the commercial Babylon, the governmental Babylon. Everybody get that picture. You can trace this out in the scriptures. All right, now. When Satan comes in, or the Antichrist comes in, and the temple is built, this will be in the middle of the tribulation years, most Bible scholars believe, and he sits in the temple and the abomination, desolation takes place. In other words, the place is abomination. I mean, you wouldn't worship God in a place like that because the devil's come in and set his image up there. I mean, that is the Antichrist. He absolutely has defiled the temple of God. And the Jews have, would have nothing to do with any uh, place that the... That the um, mm, Anybody has defiled a temple. In other words, if they thought you were defiled, now Gentiles used to be defiled and they wouldn't have anything to do with the Gentiles. So anyway, they leave the temple. Now that's in the middle of the tribulation years, okay? And that is the second part of it is called the great tribulation. And the first three and a half is the tribulation, okay? One is the tribulation years, it starts. And during that period of time, is when, evidently, is when the uh, temple will be rebuilt. The Antichrist has made the peace. He comes as a man of peace at that period of time and settles peace over there. And it, so they build the temple and he deceives people by peace, okay? 
But then he goes in and sits down and says, and we see this in, of course, Thessalonians. <coughs> I'm sorry, Second Thessalonians 5. Uh, I'm sorry, 2, uh, chapter 2. Uh, when he sits down then he and says, I am God. Boy, that's when they say, Boy, they run from that guy, and, he, and, they, and a lot of them take off, a, a remnant takes off into the wilderness, and he goes after them. And it says water comes out of his mouth. He spews water out of his mouth. You say, water? What can, you know, it's like a tolerant. In other words, a force, a force. It's not li liquid water, but it's a force of his troops are coming right against them, real heavy-like. But then he gets news that something's happening back so he has to turn his troops around and goes back and deal with that. And the people of God go into the wilderness and they're kept there by God. God keeps them safe. That's a remnant that will go over into the millennium years to repopulate the earth. Okay, so they are safe there. Now, but these are Jews. All right. So the Antichrist comes back now. <clears throat> At that period of time, there'll be a lot of different wars. He will not conquer every nation, but he will influence a lot of the world by his evil. Because you see, a lot of the nations fight against him. Okay? The people, the nations from the east come down. Uh, probably China, uh, India, Iraq, or whatever, come down against him, he has to fight them. And so there's a lot of war going on, but what I'll picture that I want to show you, where is all this happening at? Somebody tell me. Over there in that area, okay? Now, it affects us, of course. ISIS is over there fighting, killing people, cutting people's heads off. I mean, that is a picture, a clear picture almost of... Uh, of the tribulation years, which will be much greater during the tribulation years because you have, you have uh, a lot of things, earthquakes, famines, wars, killing, murdering, uh, all kind of stuff that will happen during that period of time. So we got to see the picture there. Well, Bob, why should we study all of this? Because you got people in your family that need to know some of this. So you say, well, I, I'm not going to accept Christ. Well, let me show you. Let me just show you or get this DVD that we've got from Pastor Bob and let you listen to it. And I think it would be worth your time to give this some consideration. Okay? Now, so let's turn over into Revelation 17, okay? In the book of Revelation. That's just around the corner there. Now, I said that there are two Babylons. Everybody say there's two. All right, one is spiritual and one is uh, commercial. All right, here we go. Put that up there now. Revelation chapter 17, verse 1, and let's move. I'm going to move pretty quick. All right, one of the seven angels. Okay, let me stop here now. The 14 of the judgments of God are in the first three and a half years. Okay, a little bit, it might go over a little bit, but mostly you'll see that the, the first judgments, that is 14 judgments, is in the first three and a half years. And then the second three and a half years is the judgment of bulls or vials, okay? So you see that picture. So now one of the, and when you, and when you in fact, I'll show you a scripture on that. Turn back to Revelation 16, verse, we'll start with verse 15. Okay, I'm sorry, uh, Rick, bouncing all over the place. All right, now, behold, I am going to come like a thief, blessed, happy to be envied. Now, that's Jesus speaking. Is he who stays awake, alert, and who guards his clothes so that he may not be naked, and have the shame of being seen exposed. All right, now that's Jesus speaking in Revelation 16, 15. He's talking to the people during that time that's on the earth. All right, go to the next verse. 
And they gathered themselves together, them together at the place which is Hebrew, is called Armageddon, okay? That's talking about the war of Armageddon. That's the last war. That's between the Antichrist army and the, and the uh, well, it'll be a lot of, that will be a lot against the nations also, but then Christ finally comes back and settles the whole thing. Go to the next verse. Then the seventh angel emptied out his bowls into the air, and a mighty voice came out of the sanctuary of heaven from the throne of God, saying, It is done. It is all over. It is all accomplished. It has come. So that's the tribulation years there. That's the stop of it. But you, everybody see that? All right. Now, but you've got other events that will happen. The judgment of Babylon, the religious system, the, ba the judgment of, of Babylon, the economical uh, uh, system that God will deal with. But as far as the judgments, and of course, as these angels pour out their uh, bowls of judgment, then we know that in chapter 16, that will be the end of that. Now go to the next verse. <coughs> and these following, and there following lightning and flashes, loud rumblings, perils of thunder, and a tremendous earthquake. Now isn't that something? When everything is done, then it is God's signature, a great earthquake. Nothing like it has ever occurred since men dwell on the earth. So severe and far reaching was that earthquake. Now, how many of you know in the book of Hebrews, it talks about there's going to be a time when God will shake the world. How many knows that scripture in Hebrews? You remember that? The next time he's going to shake it, but good. This is probably that, that particular point. All right, go to the next verse. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the mighty city was broken into three parts. The mighty city. Now, what we're already talking about is Jerusalem there. That's the mighty city broken in three parts. And this, and the city of the nations fell. Notice the cities of the nations fell. So this earthquake now is affecting probably the whole world. And the cities begin to fall apart. And God kept in mind mighty Babylon to make her drink, drink, drain the cup of his furious, that's, is that drink or drain? Her drain the cup of his furious wrath and indignation. All right, now we're talking about uh, Babylon. Now there's a lot of discussion about Babylon. Some say Babylon will be rebuilt. They started uh, rebuilding uh, Babylon when uh, Iraq was still before the Iraq war. Hussein was working on that. But nevertheless, here we see it as a city. And some say, well, that ain't true. So you've got certain th things that people do not agree with, but that's okay. We just put it on the shelf. As God moves along and as we study, we find out more and more about it all. Turn to the next verse now. In every island fled and no mountains could be found. Next verse. I think God is leveling things pretty good. And great excessively oppressive hailstones as heavy as a talent between 50 and 60 pounds of immense size fell from the sky on the people, and men blasphemed God for the plagues of the hail, so very great was the torture of that plague. So even with all of this coming upon the people, they still will not repent and turn to God, and God offers mercy to them. Now that's how stubborn, y'all might want to help me out with a few words there, stubborn and rebellious and come on this little body ministry there <laughs> huh all right let's just we'll just put man's ego is a dangerous thing very dangerous all right go to the next verse which is verse 
Are we in, uh, is that the next verse? Yeah, okay. Now we're back into 17. Now where, where, do we, where do we start there? Okay. All right, here we go. Now we see that in, in Revelation 16, those, that earthquake and all, that's the end of the tribulation years. Can you see the picture? Chapter 16. All right, it started in, in chapter 6. The seals. Remember the seals? 3, 4. No, it started, I'm sorry, 4 and 5. 4 and 5 is where, and I got all this in my mind, so I have to sort it out. Uh, Revelation 4 and 5, and then 6 is when it starts up in heaven. And from 6 to 16 is where the, these years of tribulation is in there. Okay, now we're coming to, God is going to deal with a religious system, okay? The religious system, the kings of the earth, crush her. That way the Antichrist will be the only one that will be worshipped. He cannot stand any other religion. He has them, they all crush all of those religious systems. You can put the Roman church in there or any church or any group of people that are not lined up with the scriptures and they're not really true to the word of God. I don't like to do that, but we're getting down to the closing of time and we've got to see how the Roman Catholic Church, how many have seen on TV and all the people are just gathered, just magnifying the Pope? How many have seen that on television? Huh? I mean, you see that, you know. I mean, one man that can rally that many people in all the different nations, even here in, in America. So this religious system that has plagued man down through the century, I don't know if many of you have studied about the Roman Catholic Church, but they have crucified many saints in the past. You know, I might be, I'm just stating facts that I've, I've studied, uh, studied on that. You just look it up on the computer if you want to. So it's the religious system that God, that the Satan will destroy. Isn't that amazing? Because he wants to be number one. Okay? You remember, Satan is a copycat. God is Trinity. Satan is going to be Trinity. Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan himself. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. So you'll see how actually Satan actually copies what God does. Okay? Now let's finish reading this. Let's get on verse 2. We're talking about the great harlot here now. Verse 2. She with whom the rulers of the earth have joined in prostitution, idolatry, and with the wine of whose immorality, idolatry, the inhabitants of the earth have become intoxicated. When you're in some group of power, some group where you have control over people, it's, an, it's almost like it makes you feel like you are somebody great. Now I didn't say much, but did anybody understand what I'm saying? Anybody that wants to be in authority, don't let them be. Always let God pick your leaders. Only let God be the one that chooses who's going to rule over you. That's why when we vote, we go to God and say, Lord, what man are, do you want in office? Power can be great but it can be intoxicated. Pride can come in. How many have studied the life of Nebuchadnezzar? How many likes to eat grass? 
God had to deal with him. Herod stood up. They all said, he's a God, he's a God. And he stood up, yeah, I'm a God. The angel struck him down like that. Boom, just like that. Took him out, pow, like that. That's why we walk humbly. How many of you know the reason that Satan fell? Hmm? Pride. If I fall and you fall, it'll be pride. So you have to, that's why the Bible says he gives grace that will meet the condition of humbling yourself. Have you ever had anybody just bawl you out face to face and you just humbled yourself and smiled at them and say, I love you too? I've had people in the congregation do me like that. Some of you have been here, you've seen it. Not bragging, not complaining, but we're talking about a principle that we have to learn. And you're blessed to have leaders that humble themselves and don't think they're a big block of cheese on the stick. Because God knows how to melt the cheese. <laughs> God's my father, but I have reverence, fear, and I walk humbly before the Lord, and I'll walk humbly as I can before God's people. I'll drink to that. I'm not getting very far, but I'm trying. Okay, let's move real quick. Verse 3, are we there now? And the angel bored me away, bored me away, wrapped in the spirit into a desert wilderness. Woo! And I saw a woman seated on a scarlet beast that was all the covered with blasphemous titles, names. And he had seven heads and ten horns. Now, you read that and you say, what in the world are those ten horns? What in the world are those seven heads? Well, if you just relax, as we go through here, the Bible will interpret it for you. Hello? All right, but don't jump ahead of me now. I told you that many times. Many, many things are interpreted by Scripture. Okay. Next verse, four. And the woman was robed in purple and scarlet and, be and bed decked with gold, precious stones and pearls. And she was holding in her hand a golden cup full of the accursed offenses and the filth of her looseness and vice. Now in Revelation you have pictures, you have images, you have things that is this literally a woman? No, it's a religious system. You got to stop and think now. Get your mind off of uh, Fulton Creek Road and see the world <laughs> out there when you have all these occults, all of these religious systems, all of these denominations, all of these people that have a religious spirit. It's, 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 to them, it's religion. But to us that have been born again, it's a relationship with God through Christ Jesus. See the, see the big difference there? Some people are very religious, but they have no relationship with God. That's what it's all about. God wants to have relationship with his creation. He caused us to be born again and gave his, us his nature that we might be able to relate to him and have fellowship with him. So you got to keep that really in place. Some people will kill the saint to save the religious system. Hello? Just save the system. This is what we do here in our church. And the saint is dying. How many really understand what I'm saying? Okay, very good. I just don't want to talk to the wall. I don't want to have to stay on that too long. But see, that's why you got to keep yourself free 
Stand fast in that liberty wherewith Christ has set you free and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. When you read about the book of Revelation, uh, not the book of Revelation, but the book of Galatians, it's all about Christians getting tangled up with do this, don't do that, uh, uh, get circumcised, you can't be saved, uh, got to keep uh, Moses, Moses, Moses' laws, I mean Moses' laws. <laughs> How many of you understand what I'm talking about? <laughs> No, you've been free. You're free. For what? To run and do your own thing? No. To walk with God. To walk with God. Your heavenly Father. Woo! All right. Let's go to the next verse. Move, gotta move, I got to move fast. Got 10 minutes. <laughs> in her forehead, there was inscribed the name of mystery, which a secret symbolic meaning. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, adulteress, and of the filth and, and, and Richard, Richard, whatever, and abomination of the earth. All right, go to the next verse. I also saw that the woman was drunk, drunk with the blood of the saints. What does that mean? This woman, this woman, is, this, this woman represents the religious system all the way back to Nimrod. How many remember Nimrod? Remember the tower? That was all an occult, occult religious system. And that has followed man down through the generations, even into the tribulation years. You'll see it in the world today. Do you realize how many occults, how many false religions there are? In India, they worship rats. They think the rats are their daddy, their grandpappy, grandma. Serious. They, they leave, they have this building, this temple, and they put food in there for the rats. And they come in on their face worshiping these rats. That's the system I'm talking about that hold men in bondage. And it comes in many different forms. Islam. They're not worshiping the God that we worship. See, we cannot be fooled and deceived. There's one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. Bob, you're just being stubborn. Yep. I read the book. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said. And no man goes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. We are so privileged to be touched by God and be called by God before the foundation of the world to be his child. And man and Satan and demonic powers have corrupted this world. And God says, that's enough. I'm going to deal with it. And I'm going to bring out a kingdom that I'll show you how it all should be, should have been. For a thousand years when Christ reigns on this earth and my saints and my children will reign with their big brother. So you got to keep things straight and, and, and realize God's talking about the evil one. I want to show you something here that might help you. Turn to 1 John 4. First John 4, 8. All right, he who does not love his has not become acquainted with God, does not and never did know him, for God is love. Everybody look at that. See that. Let that burn in your heart. Look at the next verse. In this, the love of God was made manifest, displayed, where we are concerned in that God sent his son, the only begotten or unique son, into the world so that we might live through him. We live through him and by his power, his life. Go to the next verse. 
In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice. That's what propitiation means, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Next verse. Beloved, if God, if God loved us so very much, we also are to love one another. That's the test of your Christianity. How much do you love the brethren and the sisters? Yes. Hello? That's in the Word. I'm preaching the Word. Look at the next verse now. No man is, ha, uh, has at any time yet seen God. But if we love one another, God abides, lives, and remains in us. And His love, that, that love which is essentially His, is brought to completion to its full maturity, runs its full course, is perf perfected in us by him. Believe me. All right, now what I want you to see here is another verse. I want you to turn to... Um, well, I had it marked. It, it runs... It, All right, here we go. Turn to uh, John 3 now. John 3, and look at verse 10. Now this, look at, Jesus replied, are you? No. First John, I'm sorry, uh, Rick. First John 3, 10. By this, it is made clear who takes their nature from God. Now, think, talking about nature from God and are his children. What is that? And who takes their nature from what? The devil. And are his children. You mean Satan has children? Hello? Are you out there? Has anybody ever seen somebody, you would say, you know, he's got the devil in him. You, you were probably pretty close. That's right. And that was all of us at one time because God took us out of the kingdom of darkness and took the devil's nature out of us through the cross and brought us over here to the resurrection side. Now we're children of God. We now have been, God has put his nature into us. So the people that you're dealing with out there the Bible says, bad company corrupts good boy. Now let's finish reading that. Are, the ch are his children no one who does not practice righteousness? That doesn't mean you're going to be perfect in every situation. But overall, you're a man and a woman that wants to do right. You know, if you, how many wants to do right in here? All right. Do you do right all the time? No. But you work at it. You try. You don't try to deceive people. I don't. If I mess up, it's because I'm a mess upper. <laughs> that just happens. But look, we have the nature uh, of God in us. No one who does not practice righteousness or do right, who does not conform to God's will in purpose, thought, and action is of God. Neither is anyone who does not love his brother, his fellow believer in Christ. That is the mark and we need to make sure that we love one another. Yeah, but I don't like what they do. That's something else. We are to love one another. Quiet in here. Hello? I hope I'm not disturbing your little nests. Now, if you find somebody you're not, you're not really loving, repent. Ask God to forgive you. Isn't that wonderful? And get back on the road of holiness again. Some of you probably don't like the way I'm talking up here, preaching. Man, it's raining outside. Bob, Pastor Bob, you're talking like this. Anybody see me in the message yet? Is, it, is, is anybody ever been in your life that you'd like to see? You wouldn't tell anybody, but if they just disappeared, it would be all right, would you? Yeah? 
Yeah, that's, you know. But you see, we know better than, and, and we don't go along with that. We cast those imaginations down. We, 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 we get our mind back under our control. Lord, <laughs> and I tell you, there are some people you'll have to bless every day until that thing is out of you where you'd like to, you know. We don't send them to the moon that's too close. You can see them at nighttime. Put them to Mars. Hey, did you know they found a rat on Mars? <laughs> How many know I'm, I'm, I'm telling the truth? That's what he got. It's a picture of a rat. <laughs> so say, I love every member of the body of Christ. Love one another, John 13, 34. Love one another, John 15, 12. Love one another, John 15, 17. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Romans 12, 10. Honor one another above yourself. I quit. I refuse to do that. Well, is that the nature of God speaking? That's more like the nature of the devil. Stop passing judgment on one another. Accept one another then, just as Christ said... A whole page full. One another. One another. Everybody say one another. We're talking about brothers and sisters of the Lord. We're not talking about your family. Naturally you love everybody in your family. Almost except those two. <laughs> love one another. Hey, you, you, you mess with my chicken. I'll show you something about love. Yeah, we got to let the cross work, saints. How do we get all that in the book of Revelation? Let's pray. Father, I praise you and I give you glory. I give you honor. And Lord, forgive me, Lord, for going off so far. But I pray that something was said that we'll get right on the firing line and just walk with Jesus, love one another, and be excited about what the Lord has done. Thank you for the rapture. Lord, we're looking for your appearance. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Hallelujah.